We're here today to talk to British author Andrew Taylor, a wonderful writer whom I have known for 30 years and I'm delighted to have an opportunity using this new technology that's so prevalent to reconnect with. So I was going back and remembering, you wrote Caroline Minuscule, which is the first of your books that I read in 1982. I didn't open the Poison Pen until 1989. So I came to it a bit late, but eventually um, as a publisher, Poison Pen Press, we actually published an edition of it. You did indeed, and I was, I was so pleased. And, and we had an introduction by Val McDermott, didn't we? We did, indeed. We, so can yeah, you go back and, and, and remind us? I mean, I thought Carolyn Minuscule was absolutely brilliant, but God, it's now almost, what, 40 years? Yeah. It is. It's and it and it's earning royalties still. Caroline Minuscule in various shapes and forms, not not huge ones, but it is. Well, um, can you can you give us a brief precise so that for those who have missed it, um, oh, sure. it yeah. was your first novel and it won the John Creasy Award, which is Britain's you know dagger for for best first novel. So it really started your career with a bang. It was it. I was very lucky with that book and I had no idea what I'm doing as any author does with their first novel but what I what I vaguely knew I didn't want to write a standard crime novel you know in in 1980 which was when I, I began writing it we were still really living in the tail end of the golden age um, things were very formulaic they tended to be cozy in the UK especially and I didn't want to do that. I'd been reading an awful lot of Highsmith in those days. And her idea that with Tom Ripley, you could have your central character as a murderer, and you knew he was a murderer right from the start. And, and you grew to have a sneaking affection for him too. That, that came as a sort of revolution to me. And I thought, what would happen if you, you combined that, that sort of idea with with a very English crime novel in the, I don't know, the Marjorie Allingham tradition and saw what happens. But as I said, I had no idea what I was doing. And all I knew at the beginning was the name of the book, Caroline Minuscule, which is a medieval script. And as you know, Barbara, also the name of my wife, who is not very tall. So there was a little in-joke in that. And I knew the main character would be someone like me, because I'd read somewhere you should write about what you know. And I knew he, the, in the first paragraph, he'd find the corpse of his, his academic tutor. He was a university student. And that's all I knew. I just blundered on from there, paragraph by paragraph by paragraph, until I reached the end of the first chapter. It's a miracle I ever reached the end. Well. Uh, it, it is a wonderful book, and I, I think it's a classic that will hold up. I've been talking to Martin Edwards about maybe nudging up the British Library crime classics upper year limit a bit. Um, we had a conversation about Robert Barnard, one of my personal favorite authors. Oh, what a splendid writer. Yes, and oh. such a lovely man. A dear Bob, I so miss him. I miss Bob a lot too, and a scandal in Belgravia, I think, would be a lovely candidate for the yeah. British Library Crime Classics, and I think Carolyn Minuscule as well. But in any case, um, it did win the John Creasy Dagger, and, and you've been um, prolific in winning daggers. You've won three historical daggers, and um, the Diamond Dagger, which was a very nice um, the Diamond Dagger being sponsored by Cartier, for those of you who don't know it, and is kind of a lifetime achievement sort of thing, but very much um, a tremendous honor in the pantheon of British crime writers. Although some Americans have also been honored with the Diamond Dagger as well. Including my friend Sarah Paretsky, who she is- She was the first, uh, wasn't she, I think, I, of the American? First American, I think so, yes. Yeah, right. and I know she told me that she, she um, she actually lost her diamond, her Cartier diamond dagger. And she wrote to Cartier and, and said, oh, you know, I'm awfully sorry, I've lost it. Is there any way I can, you can let me know how to make one or buy one from you? And they sent her another one free, which I thought was so delightful. That is delightful. I mean, I've been to the diamond dagger ceremonies several times. Um, mm -hmm. Alice Peters, I think, was the first one that I went to. But um, in fact, Robert Bernard's editor, Suzanne Kirk and I, 
actually represented Scribner as American publisher when Robert won the, the Diamond okay. Dagger. Yeah, yeah, which was yeah. which was wonderful. But um, I bring that up because Carolyn Minuscule was, um, as it were, a contemporary crime novel. Stuart Churton, I think, is doing something a little bit like what Carolyn Minuscule turned mm. out to be. I'm talking to him on October 8th, right? It's hard to keep up. Um, mm. and, and I do think he's doing a sort of similar thing, which is taking a, a kind of a classic form in um, Evelyn Hardcastle, really Agatha mm. Christie, and in this new book, uh, The Devil in the Dark Water, he's really riffing on Sherlock Holmes to a great degree and the locked room. Um, the classic. I've not, I've not read the new book yet. I have it, um, but he's a very interesting writer. I think he's not. He's not content to play it safe. He's oh. just trying different ways of doing things, which I, I always award somebody brownie points for that. Well, you were a pioneer in that, so you know. I guess it's good to see somebody following after you. So you went on and you wrote. Tell me about the Lidford books because those, I think. Um, maybe came next, or at least it was um, something that you wrote that had a lot of traction. And I don't even remember now how many volumes were in the Lidfords. Uh, the, my Lidmouth series is, yeah. um, I began writing that in the middle of the 1990s. And it's, it's, it's set in a sort of version of the, of the area where I live, which is on the borders of England and Wales. It's a very wooded country with rivers and hills. It's very romantic and little market towns and things. Um, and I made up a, a market town called Lidmouth and all the novels were set either in the town or in the hinterland around it, in the villages and the countryside. Um, and I wanted to set it in the 1950s because I think that was, that was such an interesting era across the world, but also in, in the UK, it was just before TV and cinema began to sort of smooth out the differences between the regions and indeed the countries um, and and you could still have a, a a relatively small area of the country with a personal identity of its own so i was tracking through the 1950s in the course of the series but i was also writing crime novels and so each of them is a is a separate crime novel with i've got two central characters who run through the whole thing and one's a police inspector who's married and the other's a woman journalist who's trying to make a, a career in, in what was then very much a man's world so they are they are my two central characters but over the eight books i've built up a whole recurring cast it's a it's it's like a soap opera in a way um i love it so much i i, I would love to write some more but it's just um i don't know it's a uh, I suppose other things come along and people wave checkbooks at you and you, you can't say no, can you, when they, when they do that? Well, they were wonderful books. I apologize. I think I called them Lidford and it's really Lidmouth, right? Yes, Lidmouth. But people, one of the things I like about the name Lidmouth is that people um, often mishear it or misread it and they they often use a name that belongs to a real town instead. So in a way, it sort of anchors this fiction, this complete fiction in a real geography, which is the icing on, on the cake for me. You know, with long form television coming in, maybe there's some, um, I know the Roth trilogy that you did write um, did have um, another platform, a visual, you know, a TV platform. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting, maybe, that the Lidmouth might turn into television because content, it seems like TV is just sucking up content in a remarkable way. Well, I'd, I'd love it if, it if it did, obviously. I mean, it's been optioned um, four times, I think. It is, it's under option now, but I, I think with COVID coming along suddenly, just as things were beginning to lift off, I, I think a lot of things like that have been pushed to one side for the time being but you know one day we can but hope and well, as i say I, not I, still, right. I would Sorry. certainly hope so i think it would be wonderful and i do think i do think that you know we're seeing such a changing landscape in terms of cinemas versus um yes. streaming and so forth that yes. there may even with the with the hitch with covid i think that you may find 
that it's a more active market and possibly more more interesting. I think that books do better in long form television, most of them, than they do in a movie where it has to be so compressed. I think you're right because I was reading something about this actually, actually this morning. Um, how 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 if you if you film a book, you you have to throw out at least sixty percent of the plot first. You've frozen up a bit, Andrew, so we'll just pause here while you come because back. To, to compress. Sorry? I said you froze a bit there, so we had to pause for... Um, oh, I feel so dear, but I'm back now. I'm back now, yeah. Now, uh, you're fine. Where, did, where did I freeze? So... Have I frozen? Um, do you think... No. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Again. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, there we are. That's all right. We just allow for it. I mean, you can't help it um, that these little glitches keep going. Yeah. So yeah. if you Technology freeze, I'll just keep like going. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, you know, while it's true that the Lydmas were historical in the sense they were 1950s, you've taken a real deep dive into historical fiction. Was the American Boy the first one where you... Um, you know, decided to write a seriously historical kind of crime novel? Absolutely. I mean, that was, I think every, if you look back in any life, if any of us looks back in their life, there are watershed moments. And, and it, in my professional career, Caroline Minuscule was one, and The American Boy was the other. And it, it, it's all the fault of Edgar Allan Poe. I was, I, I was reading the short stories for the umpteenth time, about 20 years ago, and, and in the introduction, the, the compiler mentioned that um, Poe was half English, and he'd spent four or five years of his childhood in England. And I had no idea about this. And once I, I did the math, and I realized that Edgar Allan Poe could have actually walked to the same streets as a small boy as Jane Austen just before she died. And suddenly, here was this, here was the, the great, you know, forefather of American literature, striding, striding the streets of London as a small boy and meeting Jane Austen. And, and the idea of Edgar Allan Poe as a boy in that world just set my mind on fire. And I thought, what if one could do a crime novel using young Poe and yet somehow prefiguring things that he later used within his crime stories and, and indeed mystery stories and, and horror. So it was one of those sort of mad ideas that come to you in, in, in about 30 seconds flat and your brain sort of burns up. It, it was fabulous. Um, and I, I went to my, my publisher, I just sent her a sheet, one sheet of paper and said, I'd love to do this, what do you think? And, and within, a, within a day she was back and she offered me a contract for it. Um, my lovely publisher, Julia Wisdom in the UK, who's, who's, um, who's been a great support over the years. And it was, it was just one of those books that took off, really. The one thing I regret is that when it came out in the States, that they published it as an unpardonable crime, which I think, I, I really wish they kept the original name. But what do you think, Barbara, as a professional? Was, was that an unwise choice of theirs? I think I preferred your your title, and I you know I never do entirely understand the reasoning behind some title decisions, which I have to tell you are most often made by the sales department, not yeah. the editorial department, and um, based upon you know whatever whatever difficulties a title might present in terms of sales. One good thing. I have to say, Andrew, about where we are at the moment is that the Monopoly, which when an American boy published, was pretty much Barnes and Noble, um, mm. less less Amazon than today. Mm. They had an inordinate amount of control and could often ask publishers or insist on publishers changing cover art, for example, or titles. Um, mm. And so I never was sure with your book whether it was really 
the publisher's sales department or whether it was the buyer at Barnes and Noble or what came together. Um, yeah. But, you know, an American boy, which is really the whole point of, yeah. of Poe uh, in London, um, being an American and coming as a surprise is lost when the book is called An Unpardonable Crime. Yeah. So um, I, we sold the English edition, as you know, um, because we do a, a very serious import business and uh, our sales for, for an American boy were essentially the, the English edition as an American boy, which you kindly autograph for us. So it never became a big problem for us. Um, you know, what can I say? Uh, it's possible. It's still in print, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So at some point, you know, possibly that title might be revisited, but then that causes confusion. So probably best to leave it as it is. But you've gone on to other eras. I mean, with Poe, you are, as you say, Jane Austen died in what, 1817? Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're in Regency, England. But you've gone on uh, up into the 18th century when you have written um, at least one novel set in New York um, at that time. But then recently you've been writing about the 17th century and London. And so I have a question for you, which is, I always find it interesting that there are some historical periods that really work well for crime fiction. For example, Egypt does well, nobody cares about Babylon or Assyria. Roman does well, Greek, ancient Greek, not so much. Um, 15th, no, 16th century England, the whole Elizabethan thing and the Tudors, mm -hmm. massive. 18th century, less so, but still important. And of course, Victorian and Edwardian is huge. But the 17th century, to a great degree, is kind of like an orphan century in crime fiction. Do you have any thoughts about why that might be true? Uh, I think it's partly a notion of accessibility that, that readers feel about Victorian times. They can, they can see, see the evidence of it of it around them they can they can read the books they can look at the pictures they can hear the music it's all it's all very accessible and even even if you go back to the 18th century i suppose it's um in the second half of the 18th century anyway a novel written there is accessible to the modern reader um in a slightly different way egypt where we're all familiar with it with the great remains of Egypt, the same with Rome. It's it's it, it's a it's a it's a civilization and a culture that's influenced all of us hugely, and its its architecture, its political thinking, and so on is around us everywhere. So it's accessible. And as for as for the 16th century with the Tudors and Elizabeth, I mean Elizabeth is such a sort of live wire, fascinating character. Um, and all all the plots with the Spanish and the, the Catholics and everything. It's just that it's, it's made for it. And of course, because of Shakespeare, again, we think we're, we're familiar with the period. We've got some reference points already. But I don't think we have as many reference points in the 17th century. But that, for me, was part of the charm. I, I quite like periods in history where not many people have been before in terms of writing historical crime novels there. I, I like to be a pioneer if I can. Um, and I also like periods where there's a, there's a huge sense of transition. And that restoration period when Charles II had come back to the throne after Oliver Cromwell had died and the Civil War was over, that was a period of transition, between a huge transition in so many ways, not just politically, sort of ushering ushering in the rule of parliament a bit later, but also in terms of science at the age of Newton, architecture, the age of Wren. Um, so much was going on then. And, and it's, it seemed a very fertile, fertile setting for an author to explore. Um, yeah, anyway, that's it. That's, that's why I chose the 17th century. Um, and I'm very glad I did actually, certainly in the UK, because it's, it's actually worked out extremely well. It has worked out well for you. I asked you the question in part because, curiously, 
tonight, I am talking to Alice Hoffman, and we are in the 17th century in Northern England, dealing with oh, witches really? as part of her practical magic thing. And tomorrow, yep. I'm talking to Stuart Turton, and Again, now we're in 1634, but yeah. we are in fact in, um, in the Dutch East India Company and Batavia, and so we have all sorts of interesting things we can talk about, about, you know, um, private stock companies and venture capitalism, which is really what it was, and, you know, the dynamics leading to maritime insurance and Lloyd's of London, all that sort of thing. David Liss, if you recall, wrote a really brilliant book, One oh, Year, yeah. Conspiracy of Paper, which yeah. was really focused, I mean, being a crime novel, it needed something terrible to happen, and it was really focused on the South Sea bubble to, as a, as a, um, a major financial catastrophe that ensnared people. But Andrew, he wrote an earlier book, which I love, called The Coffee Trader, in which he talked about, he segued from Holland's monopoly over tulips mm -hmm. to Holland's uh, attempt or an attempt that he created in his book. I'm not really sure, to be honest, how much of it was true, um, about trying to corral the coffee industry, and as part of that, I've never forgotten this, as part of that, he came to the store and demonstrated how the Dutch made coffee in the 17th century with coffee beans. And I have to tell you, it was really disgusting. <laughs> I'm just making a note as you, as you talk. What, what's it called, the coffee? It's called The Coffee Trader. Coffee I believe trader. it was the book he wrote after A Conspiracy of Paper. Yeah. Uh, but basically what they did was they ground up the beans and red wine is involved. And honestly, it was totally undrinkable. I mean, we all were <laughs> gagging. <laughs> yeah. But so you wondered in a way how coffee really got going if that was the, you know, the recipe for it. But, um, but so, you know, really the 17th century is what set up um the financial markets and the huge developments in the 18th century you know and it was like mm -hmm. the dawn of capitalism i've actually read the trials of warren hastings um the british east india company has always mm -hmm. fascinated me the idea that a company i'm trying to remember the entire name of it a company of merchants honorable east East India Company, isn't it? The, yeah, you know. something like that. And the Dutch, the same, that governments really allowed these, um, you know, collections of merchants to sail off and explore and conquer and then actually govern foreign mm. territories. I mean, if it hadn't been for the India mutiny, I don't know that Victoria ever would have been the empress and the East, British East India Company might have continued, you know, to rule <laughs> India up to the First World War. It's quite interesting, this, isn't it? Because the, the, the companies were set up for trade to bring mm -hmm. exotic goods, sell them, sell them in, in the West for vast amounts of money. Um, but in order to do that, they had to have trading posts in India, in Africa, wherever. And gradually, that meant they got involved with local, local politics. So they needed their own army and so on. It just expanded from there. It was a matter. So the, the political side of it came, came almost by accident. I mean, I think that's what's so interesting about the, a lot of the British Empire and the Dutch Empire was that it happened by accident. They didn't set out to conquer the world. Um, they found themselves doing it because it made trade work more easily. Private competitors wanted them to do it. It, it, was, it was not a sort of national undertaking. No, not at all. It was profit driven. And if you really look at a map of the British Empire in the 19th century, you will see that, you know, it was a series of important ports. I mean, it was Hong Kong and it was Singapore and it was whatever in India and it was Malta and the Mediterranean and it was eventually the Suez Canal, you know, but um, it was in service of the Navy in the same way that, you know, Cape Town was a uh, a crucial stop going around yep. the horn in order to go east. I thought of it in part because, you know, your book set in New York um, and then Stuart's book where we're starting in Indonesia, known as the Spice Islands, it made me think about the Dutch having made 
possibly a poor decision financially, giving up <laughs> New York for the Spice Islands, yeah. which is what they did. Yes, they did that in what in the 1660s. In fact, in my period, um, they 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 traded that after after the end of one of the Dutch wars with England. Um, it was part of the settlement, and it was. I, th I think the British had invaded it, haven't, haven't they? But the, the Dutch said, "Oh, we don't, we don't want it. You can have it." And it was very, it was very handy for the British. And it, it, it's always amused me, inordinately, that um, during the American Revolution, or as I call it, the American War of Independence, that New York was the center of the British, the British Empire in America. It was where all, all the troops were concentrated, all the fleets. It, it, was, it was the nerve center of the British Empire. And the Union Jack flew over Manhattan. I, I think it's hysterically funny. Well, I can't, I can't argue with you about that. Um, I've, I've enjoyed your books. And there's a lovely guy named Patty Hirsch who has written some books also in New York, you know, um, early on, which, which I have enjoyed very much. So now I have another question for you. You can help me out here before I talk to Alice. Why do you think did witches gain so much traction in the 17th century? I don't remember them as being such a, um, so persecuted or so visible during the Elizabethan era, but they really, 17th century has a tremendous amount of. Yeah. Um, I. I suspect the real answer is deeply buried in the sort of psychology of the time. Um, that that it, it tended to be involve extreme puritanical communities. And it's this, this, I don't know, fear of the devil, fear of evil, and if you're afraid of something, if you can pin it onto something, a person, that's a, that's a way of externalizing it, obviously. And I, I suspect it's something to do with that. And then, and then once it starts, mass hysteria is a, is a horribly familiar phenomenon with us all, even, even today. Once it starts, particularly in a small, isolated community, it's very hard to stop, isn't it? Um, so I, I think it's something to do with that, but I, I, I'm not sure there's a cut and dried answer for why witchcraft was so significant in the, in the 17th century, and also why it gradually lost importance. Um, and unless, I mean, it's something to do, of course, with the um, rise of empirical science in, in the later 17th century. And the, the, by the 18th century, you get people much more relaxed about religion and superstition. So I think it's all to do with that, the, the reason why it stopped gradually. But, but why it began then? You know, I, you've heard my guess. You'll have your guess, I'm sure. What do you think? Well, I think you raise a really important point that um, it, part of it is allied to extreme Protestantism, because I mean, Scotland and the North of England were really hotbeds for it. Yeah. And then yeah. the Puritan community, you know, Salem infamously in America, although that was brought over. I once, Andrew, allowed myself, gosh, it must have been at least 20 years ago or more, we were in Lancaster and you can um, elect to be locked up in the deep dark dungeon that the witches were kept in before the trials and yeah. Lancaster. And I will tell you that a sane person could have stepped in and come out completely insane because it's total sensory deprivation. It mm -hmm. is so ink dark in there that you literally could hold up your hand right directly in front of your face and be unable to see it. And if you were in that situation for some time, I think you would come out so able that you know it would be easier to accuse you of possession or witchcraft or same thing. I think part of it was an attempt. Um, I don't want to be too feminist here, but I mean it was almost all directed at women. So yes. I think I think that was part of it certainly. Um, in Spain, as women, as women were seen by their nature as simple, you know, it yes. was Eve who who gave Adam the apple. Um, 
so yes, yeah, so it, it was it was very convenient for a masculine community to to put all all the sin upon a woman. It was like a lightning conductor, I suppose. It so was. Anyway. You know, some of it some of it was like a property grab too. You know that if there was a woman who had most of them were poor, and many of them you know, had had kept track of herbal skills and so forth. And so they were feared because they had some sort of knowledge, you know, medical and other that that other people lacked. But in some cases, I think it was an opportunity, you know, if you accuse somebody to grab their property. I mean, you know, it's the same thing that went on under the Nazis or, you know, if you particularly look at Paris um, during the during the Second World War, where people were, you know, accusing their neighbors or turning them in as Jews in order to, you know, swipe their property. I mean, mm -hmm. that's been that's been an ongoing thing. I think about it a little bit in terms of QAnon and some of the absolutely insane, you know, theories that are running around in scapegoating or you know making people fearful. Um, it's happening again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean. There's so much, you know, history definitely repeats itself. There's no question about it. So tell me what, what you're working on. And before that, um, you just did uh, one of my favorite mystery conferences has always been at St. Hilda's in Oxford. And while I haven't been for a long time, I have many, many fond memories of August at mm -hmm. St. Hilda's. And you were just involved with the St. Hilda's conference and in fact, in a play, right? Yes. I, I... I, St. Hilda's is, um, my aunt went there, so I had a sort of little personal connection, you know, in the 1930s. And I started going there over 20 years ago. And I, I, I think I've gone every year, more or less, ever, ever since. But this year, of course, it was very different because we couldn't actually go there physically. So we had to do the whole thing over Zoom. And I, I have to say, St. Hilda's College was brilliant about organising the, the technical side. And one of the things we did was a whodunit play, um, which I wrote. But it was called The Murder of Lucy Ackroyd. And <laughs> set in a college, not unlike St. Hilda's. Um, and we had five voices of suspects. Lucy Ackroyd, I should say, is a, is a literary novelist who's, a, who's a, an alumna of the college. And she's foully murdered, naturally. Um, and then we had the five suspects who included, for example, Val McDermott, Mick Heron, um, uh, and even, a, even an actress, I don't know, um, no, you probably don't know her name, but anyway, it was, it was, a, it was um, an all-star cast and we had such fun, we had such fun and there was, because it was on Zoom, we had many, many more people than before, usually, as you know, the size of the college constrains how many people can come and it's rare to have have more than 100 people there but because it was on zoom we had three or four hundred people from all over the world and that was wonderful that that sense making it more international embracing more people and i was so delighted one of them a lady in london actually worked out the right solution of the murder mystery and it wasn't easy it wasn't easy. She was very impressive. I took my hat off to her. How wonderful. You know, you're absolutely right that the number of people that you can engage um, is, is quite large because considerations of travel and health and other things, you know, fade back. And I, I think as we go forward, we've been a hybrid operation in that sense since 1995 because we found yeah. our first... Yeah. Um, and I do think that the possibility of doing live, but at the same time recording it, you know, filming it, is um, it's the way to go forward. We've operated like that at the Poison Pen for 20 years or more. Um, all yeah, of our events, have, yeah, have been have been broadcast on Facebook. So uh, mm -hmm. this was a, a natural transition for for us to use the Zoom platform to do events. But we have been surprised at the very large number of viewers. And we're also constantly surprised at which authors get the largest ones. It is not always the ones that you expect. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's been very unpredictable and it makes me want to know what the drivers are. 
you know, have you any idea what it might be? Have you any theories about why some authors attract more interest than others? Yes, I do. Um, I think that it's very dependent on the author's social media. I mean, we have a 20 some thousand person mailing list of our own and, um, and that doesn't include, you know, other people who are customers and viewers. We've, we've always been that way. A small percentage really of our customers live in Arizona. It's never been more than 20 or 30 percent. It's always been quite national and international. But what we think is that the author is most active on social media and who have acquired the largest presence are the ones that tend to get um, many more views and podcast downloads. Uh, so that a out. lot of it, we may be surprised because we don't normally see a particular author's fan groups that much. I mean, there are some best-selling authors who for us don't sell as well for one reason or another and some authors less well known who for a poison pen sell tremendously. So, you know, there's always been that consideration. Um, I don't know how much extra word of mouth has to do with it. I do know that authors who've had, let's say, a significant um, television or other platform tend to get lots of viewers. We did an event with Craig Johnson where the star of Longmire, who was mm. in Australia, and whose daughter was running around while we were doing it, chasing kangaroos. So I can only say it was a completely chaotic performance. Um, but he had thousands of views. And, you know, we don't know how much of those were driven by fans of the TV who just wanted to see Robert Taylor Longmire. And mm -hmm. how much of that was our, our share, because we've always had a big market share of Craig Johnson's books, because he started out signing at the store and has signed every book he's ever written at the store. Um, you know, CJ Box, for example, I'll be interested to see what happens. CJ, we have been with him from the beginning. We launched almost all of his book tours. He has not one, but two TV series coming up. Big Sky starts this month and is based upon um, novels, not in his Joe Pickett series, but then the Joe Pickett novels are going to have a a separate series. So it'll be interesting to see whether there will be a gigantic jump in views for CJ, assuming that his launch in March is virtual. And yeah. I don't know that it will be because, you know, he may elect to come down from Wyoming and, um, and do some kind of a hybrid where we do a video presentation in the store and then his fans can do a walk by outdoors lot. Our season is winter, so where everybody else is going inside, we're all coming outside in Arizona because it's been 115 all summer, so everybody's been inside. So yeah. we're, we're like the obverse of, you know, the normal, the normal deal. So in, in the winter, in the spring, when there are a lot of big authors, we could actually do outdoor masked signings where fans, you know, can, can do that. It's too soon to tell how that will all be structured. But again, and I, I think the other factor is how many things is an author doing? Because you can slice and dice easily. Um, if you do a lot of Zoom events, then, you know, you cut into each one of them with the extra ones that you do. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes if we have a big name author who isn't getting a lot of views, my theory is that it's because they're doing so many things that we only get a small amount of market share, so to speak. So for example, we're doing John Grisham next week, but John Grisham's doing a lot of things. So I don't expect it to be huge. If we were the only people doing John Grisham, I would expect it to be tremendous, you know. Um, and as people are finding their way into doing things and there's so much going on, um, I think that people's attention is getting of course, right now we're in the middle of this election nonsense. So, you know, that further makes it confusing. But yeah. I don't know if by next spring, if people are going to be tired of sitting around just watching stuff all the time. And, and that will diminish because if they're back into normal lives and doing more stuff, then they have less time to sit in front of a screen. Mm. Now, so that may make a profound change in, in how this is working. 
But I am grateful that we have Zoom in time for the pandemic, because I do think that for, for fans, for readers, for authors, for booksellers, whatever, for everybody, that without Zoom or Crowdcast or whatever it is you choose, you know, to be your platform, this would have been really dreadful, really isolating. I know, it's been great. And, and as you said right at the beginning, I mean, one of the great things has been it's actually encouraged us to reconnect, you know, for you and me connecting. You know, we haven't actually met in person for what, five, ten years? I don't know. Something it's been like a long time. At one point, my husband and I recognized that we were spending all our foreign travel in England and that if we ever wanted to see the rest of the world before we <laughs> could no longer travel, we yeah. needed to stop. Um, yeah. And so, in fact, we have ranged all over the world. Um, and I'm really glad for all the places that I have been because, you know, I don't know that I have as many travel years left to me as, as I could wish. It all, it all depends. Um, but I did ask you that question I'd love to end on. Tell us what you're working on now because we got lost there in the weeds. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing the fifth of my restoration novels, which, which are, are basically moving through the restoration period from the Great Fire of London, which destroyed most of London. And a thread running through it is the, is the rebuilding of London um, from the ashes, which was incredibly exciting. The reason we have fire insurance is the Great Fire of London, by the way. It was invented after the Great Fire. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, again, a bit like the Lidman series. I want to track through the history of the period, but by writing independently, uh, uh, crime novels within the period, sort of using elements of the history. So it's, a, it, it's my way of getting to know the history of the period, the culture of the period, the social life of the period, Sam Peter's diary, brilliant stuff, and also writing crime novels about it. And yes, this new one is number five in the series called The Royal Secret. Um, and I'm, I'm teetering on the edge of finishing it, but I'm not quite there, unfortunately. Oh, no, I, th I, I think it's a wonderfully interesting period. Um, and, you know, I've always, I really like Charles II, but I've always thought that he singularly failed in the, in the most important thing that kings are supposed to do, which is to provide heirs. And, you know, stayed married to Catherine of Braganza, who was clearly the problem because he had illegitimate children all over. So it certainly wasn't Charles. And I've never quite understood why he um, didn't, in fact, divorce her and, um, and provide was, a dynasty. Maybe it was because he thought his brother was, you know, just there to take over. But that proved to be a really weak decision. Um, so, you know. I, I don't know. I've, I've always found that such an interesting thing about both Elizabeth and Charles, you know, not choosing to marry, where all around them, their ancestors, you know, were madly marrying, serially marrying, in point of fact, sometimes, to try to achieve an heir. I mean, that's why the 16th century is just like, it is a game of thrones in so many respects. Um, so I don't know if you're, you know, going to write long enough to explore that, but I've always found it fascinating. I think, I think Charles II, actually, in a funny way, was a family man, and he was very loyal to Catherine of Braganza, even though she failed to give him an heir. Um, and he was under huge pressure to divorce her and marry again, or even legitimize the Duke of Monmouth, who was the eldest of the, of the bastards, um, and very, very popular in his own right. Um, but he, he not only was a loyal a loyal husband in a really weird way, even though he was a philanderer, big time. He was also, he also believed in kingship and that it was something sacred coming from God. And the royal succession was important to him. It was important to him that the legitimate heir should inherit. And that heir was his brother James, unfortunately. He wasn't, he wasn't really up to it, as we know. Um, so it's a, that's the reason, I think. But Charles II, he's such a fascinating, conflicted, enigmatic character. You can speculate for hours on his motive. Well, he had, he had a terribly unfortunate life in, the, in a sense that, you know, I mean, his elder brother died. Uh, no, no it was his father's elder brother, Henry, that, that yeah. died. But, 
<clears throat> you know, he lived through the revolution. His father was beheaded. He had to go into exile. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, terrible things by the time he came to the throne. And I, I agree that he was indeed a faithful and loving husband, but I don't know that it would have been a disgrace for Catherine had he, you know, divorced her and remarried, although she's Catholic, so perhaps he just couldn't bring himself to do that. Well, divorce was just really not an option at that time, particularly for a king. It, was, it would have been a huge seismic event. I know Henry VIII did it, but Henry Henry VIII was a, was a, was one of these larger larger in life characters, driven by his um, almost childlike in his urges and desires. But but Charles wasn't like that. I, I'm I mean he's a, he's a character who runs through through the series because he's, he's important. Um, but actually, as a king, he was oddly successful on the years he was on the throne. He, he inherited a very difficult situation. And he was still there after 25 years, hugely popular among the people. And when he died, surrounded by the mistresses, the wife, the illegitimate children, loving brother, you know, he didn't do too badly, really, I think. He died in his own bed. He did, which was not a privilege accorded to his father. I've really? often thought the Stuarts were really unlucky, but also, also often made poor decisions. Um, not poor right. decisions, but decisions that um, were not pragmatic, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think that's true. So, you know, and without Charles, we wouldn't then have had William and Mary, and then we wouldn't have had the Germans. So, you know, it really did alter the course of English history because, you know, then you had Scottish kings and then you had the Dutch and then you had, you know, eventually yeah. had to go all the way back to Sophie of Hanover. So, you know, Charles was the pivot around which many things changed. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Find, but what a great time for you to write about. Yeah, it is, it is. If we if we ever have a William V, you know, after Prince Charles, that I, I find it quite ironic that that his mother, Lady Diana, was was descended from one of Charles II's royal bastards. So, in other words, the the bloodline's coming back. Very true, and we could bring in Edward the Seventh as well. And <laughs> now it's, it's, it's really very interesting. Charles has not been a lucky name for British monarchs. So, um, you know, well, it'll be interesting to see how it all goes. But we digress. Um, Andrew, thank you for your time. Um, I can't tell you what a joy it has been to talk to you again. I've really missed you. It's lovely to see you again. And, and let's hope we can meet in person again before too long. Well, we will. And I should add as a coda here that we will be meeting again in November. Um, and I think that we of agree course. on that on the 14th because you are going to be part of the program yes how done it that done andrew it. um sorry you and la griffith and aileen templeton have agreed to join martin edwards and talk about this volume which was created as a fundraiser for the crime writers i mean for the detection club but mm -hmm. is i think absolutely must reading for anyone interested in writing or even just reading crime fiction, because how many of you contributed pieces about writing? I think altogether, there's something like 80 or 90, um, but many of them are former members. All the contributors are past or present members of the Detection Club, which for those of you who don't know, is a, a sort of private dining club for, for, for crime writers in the UK. You, you can't join it, you have to be asked to, to join you know that people have to come and invite you um and it's it's um it's a bit like the house of lords for crime fiction in the uk and so these are these are people from agatha christie gk chesterton dorothy says all the way up to val mcdermott and ian rankin so it's quite a range um, it is indeed quite a range. I've been lucky enough to have been invited as a guest to several meetings at the Detection Club. And the last one I attended was at the Savoy. And I mm. ventured down to um, the ladies' retiring room, powder room, toilet, whatever you want to call it, which at the Savoy at that time was very pink. 
um, and discovered sitting there on a chair um, was P.D. James, at that point, Baroness Holland. Oh, do sit down, she said, and visit with me, so we don't have to go back. And so I sat on the floor on the pink carpet. <laughs> she sat on her stool, and we spent, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes together. And, you know, uh, it was completely fascinating. So um, I miss it. Uh, Peter Lovesey has taken me to one, I think it was the meeting before Ellis Peter's Diamond Dagger. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping to be able to come back to the UK and I'll have to try to time it to another meeting of the Detection Club because it's so much fun to do that. We will. That, that, that would be lovely. Well, thank you. You can come thank as my guest. Well, how very kind. Thank you very, very much. Um, and Andrew, um, I will see you then in November and thank you for spending time with me today. Pleasure, Barbara. Bye. <laughs>